All right, hello everybody, and welcome to our second session of the day. Uh, we had some brief hiccups, but we powered through those, and here we are. I'm excited to welcome Charlene Lee today. She's going to be talking about five ways that your leadership must change to thrive with remote work. So Charlene is a New York Times bestselling author and an expert on digital transformation and disruptive growth strategies. Uh, for the past two decades, Charlene's been helping people see the future. She's the New York Times bestselling author of six books, including her newest release, The Disruption Mindset, Why Some Businesses Transform While Others Fail, and Open Leadership, as well as the co-author of the critically acclaimed book, Groundswell. She's an entrepreneur who founded and ran Altimeter Group, a disruptive industry analyst firm that was acquired by Profit in 2015. With over 20 years of experience in tech and business, she has been a respected advisor to Fortune 500 companies on digital transformation and leadership. Charlene also serves on the regional board for YPO, a global network of CEOs. Thank you for joining us today. It's all over to you. All right. Thank you so much for having me. So let's just get right into it. Um, so what, one of the things I wanted to really talk about today is what is changing in the landscape? Obviously a lot. Um, and one of the things that I've been talking to leaders about is uh, they, they haven't really changed the way they lead. And so as somebody who has studied not only leadership, but also disruption and how leaders deal with that, I wanted to share some of the findings that I have. So first of all, we feel disrupted when we are not in control, uh, when we can't see the future. And also the biggest reason why we feel disrupted is that the way that we see the world, the order that what the world has been laid out for us, in particular, the way that we have defined our relationships with each other, are just being completely torn apart. And nothing is, is as symbolic of that as more than this, this really real state that we're not even physically near the people that we love, our friends, and also the, our colleagues and coworkers. And so today what I wanna talk about is not only how do you do with just remote workers, uh, but also what I think is going to be the new state of things. This is not going to change over the next couple of weeks. This is something that is a reality that we are going to have to live with for the future as we see it. And so I don't want to only talk about what it means to be working in what I call distributed environments, um, but also how our leadership just needs to change to adapt to this new reality that we have, this new normal that we have to create. So what I'm going to be talking about today is really how we can use this disruption as an opportunity for change. And what, we'll, uh, what I'll show you is that disruption has happened all the time around us. Oftentimes we would like to be thinking that we are creating disruption, rather than having the disruption happen to us. And what I want you to think about is how do we change our mindsets to think about opportunities for change and impact because of this disruption? So I'm gonna talk about five things. Um, first of all, how do you show up as a strategic leader? Second, how do we establish security and stability? A very important thing right now for ourselves and for our teams with what struct what I call structure. Third, we'll talk about openness and why that is so important in this day and age. We'll talk about how to communicate in what I call 3D. And then we'll finally talk about the opportunities that are being created. So lots to cover over the next 25 minutes or so. So the first thing I wanna talk about is how do you show up as a strategic leader? And this is some research that a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Robert Glazer, had done with Todd Herman. And one of the things they lo looked at was how do you approach crises? So what Todd Herman did, because he was at home in quarantine, he went out and reached out to 29 CEOs that he knew, and he interviewed them and did a cloud tag of, um, a, a word tag of all the words that they were using to describe the situation and divided them into three groups. The first group of leaders were fear focused. They were constantly checking the news, really thinking about um, worrying about things, casting blame. And this was really clouding their judgment and ability to, to lead. The another group uh, of leaders was the unfocused leaders. They knew they had to put a plan together, but really were frozen by just uncertainty and analysis paralysis. And the third group were these strategically focused leaders. They were actively engaged in thinking about the things that they need to do. And not only that, they were already taking action. They were anticipating where the changes were going to come and taking action, making plans, creating the resources, making the tough decisions to move forward. Now, you may be sitting and thinking like, how on earth did you do that in this chaos? And I have to admit myself, I was very much in that fear focused and unfocused uh, state for the past two weeks. 
And things have begun to become much clearer for me as I'm able to push some of those things aside. Uh, having my kids back at home really helped a lot from, from their colleges. So just that sort of centering and the peace of mind has really helped me personally focus. And I think as leaders, one of the key things we have to think about is how do we move forward? And I think the biggest issue that we have as leaders is that we want to have the answer. And I think the biggest change you have to make as a leader is to give that up. Your job as a leader isn't to have all the answers. Your job as a leader right now in particular is to ask the right questions in order to focus your team. They were just as discombobulated as you and everyone else. And your job as a leader right now is to show up and be strategic and to, again, not have the answers, but to make sure that people are connecting with each other and really feeling that, that sense of stability and security, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, one of the things that I think is important to do this, to keep that centering for yourself as a leader, is to connect, to connect with as many other leaders, reach out to your network and fill in those gaps of knowledge and experience that you may not have. No one has perfect information. And the fact that you're here today listening to the summit is a testimony to the fact that you're trying to reach out. And then also, I think you want to keep everyone moving forward, thinking about what that future looks like. And we'll give you some tips about how to do that. And then finally, I think for the long term, we're going to be moving to a new type of what I call a balanced score sheet against different stakeholders. The Business Roundtable came out in August with the purpose of a corporation, which is no longer just to increase the value of shareholders, but it's also to look out for the good of your customers, of your employees, of your suppliers, your community, as well as your shareholders. I think this time, more than any other time, we need to be thinking about that balanced stakeholder that we need to be taking care of. At this point, it's going to be requiring all of us as individuals, as communities, as businesses, and also as our government to be able to pull together. So thinking about these in a very much balanced way, in a strategic way as a leader is absolutely essential. And not only for your organizations, but across all aspects of your life. So that's about being a strategic leader. And one of the things I would encourage you to do is to make the time and space right now to refill your leadership capacity. Uh, what we found is that the strategic leaders that are out there make it a regular practice to have exercise, to do meditation, to have a religious practice. They go and pay, they do something to get out of their heads and to reconnect with their hearts. Again, connect and network with other leaders. And if you can, even join or create your own personal-based personal advisory board. And in these tough times, it's going to be essential to have a group of people who you can trust, where you can be vulnerable. I have been a part of a YPL CEO group for the past nine years, and I can't stress enough how invaluable that has been, and especially over the past few weeks, as a sounding board for my insecurities, my vulnerabilities, so that I can be the strongest leader and show up as a strategic leader for the people who are following me. So let's go on to the second way that you need to change. And that is to establish new norms in order to create stability. And this is all about creating structure, recreating structure to replace the one that is no longer there. And a couple of ways to do this um, in particular is to clarify what does it mean to work now? What are the foundations for what it means to work? And a key part of this is to focus on results because, we, because you don't see people anymore. How do you know that people are working? It's not about the hours you put in, but it's really about the results. So be very, very clear about what the goals are and how you're going to measure them. Really clearly define what does success look like, especially in these turbulent times. Uh, another thing that we're seeing a lot of organizations do is to go from scheduled meetings to daily standups and asynchronous work. And many of my colleagues later on in the summit today will be talking in much greater detail about how do you actually manage people from a remote distance. And very importantly also, the time boundaries for work are completely up in the air these days. Um, people in the home environment and in, in the different kind of flexible environments that you have are going to be working at different times and hours. So asynchronous work is going to be much more important. And think about this as an opportunity to also lay down new ways of working. Again, disruption is an opportunity to change. So how can you create greater agility 
greater flexibility and increased collaboration in this time. Consider this as an opportunity to lay down these new habits. Think about it as uh, fast forwarding your digital transformation efforts because you have no choice but to work in a different way today. Um, one thing I would say as an analyst, having covered uh, internet, uh, in, uh, internet and enterprise collaboration, my one big advice on this in creating structure is to lay down which tools you're going to use. What we found in the research, Wing Central did a, um, some research, is that because employees have so many different options for apps, they're losing an hour a day just switching back and forth between the apps. So use the minimal number of tools that you can. I've laid down a couple of the key ones that you need to have and be really clear, for example, where the communications are going to be. Highly, highly recommend if you're not doing this already to get out of email, to go on to one and only one messaging platform, whichever one that's going to be. There was a long list here, but I tell you my secret weapon is World Time Buddy because that allows me to figure out what time zones people are in. So I'm not calling them at two o'clock in the morning. Let's go on to um, another area, which is uh, the area of openness. Uh, this is a concept that's been out there and floating around. A lot of tech companies are using this. More and more companies are moving into the space. Um, and, and I think it's a really important area because openness and transparency create accountability. And what I've seen with leaders is that they really struggle with this idea of being more open. Because as leaders, we've been told our entire career to not be open and that it's dangerous to be open. You want to be closed in to court information because that's where safety and power comes from. And what we're finding in this new space and this new way of working, openness is a strength. It is a core capability of the most disruptive organizations that are out there. My research found that they're incredibly open, they're transparent because that creates trust and speed, agility, and accountability. So a couple reasons why openness and transparency work. Um, first of all, it creates that accountability. You can't hide if everything's out in the open. When you say you're gonna do something, people can see if you did it or not. It also forces the difficult conversations that you don't want to have. We're humans, we don't want to have these things that are difficult, but when it's in the open, you can't ignore it. It also does a very important thing. It removes the fear of failure. Because when you see people failing all around you and not meeting their deadlines, not meeting their goals, the instinct is not to blame them, but to say, how can I help? So failure is not so much, the failure in an open environment isn't that you don't do things, it's that you don't, you're not open and honest and vulnerable about needing to get help from your colleagues. And then finally, I think openness also addresses a very key issue in terms of diversity and inclusion in our organizations. It creates opportunities for many diverse perspectives to filter up through the organizations. When people don't feel ability to be open and honest about what's going on, or if the only person in the room, you fear raising your hand, uh, this is, again, one of the things that allows all these diverse opinions and, and topics to, again, filter up and be heard and seen. So a couple tips, because this is not the most natural place for people to be, for leaders to be. Here are some ways to actually create openness in your organization. First of all, identify the places where trust is already low. There may be a team that is just feeling very fragile. There may have been a place or a project that isn't going very well. Use openness to create trust in those areas because that's where openness is going to be most beneficial in terms of creating that trust. And, and this is something that I think is very important. Think about the way you share data in the organization. I was speaking to a leader yesterday and she was saying, yeah, but my leaders, my executive team, we all that have access to all of our strategic documents, our essential documents, and we realized that nobody else in the organization could see it. And that this is not anything confidential. So they decided with a fell swoop to make all of it available to the entire organization, except for a little small part of confidential information. So I think the default going forward as much as you can is to put everything out in the open for your organization to see. And private is the exception. Right now, we have the reverse. We keep everything closed and private because, again, information is scarce. It's important to keep it closed. But if you really think about it, 
how much better could people do their jobs if they had that information in their hands? And then finally, as a leader, I strongly encourage you to use whatever collaboration platforms that you have and make sure you show up, set the example, and encourage people to share, to be open about things. And that begins with yourself. How are you going to be open? How are you going to get out there and be transparent about how things are going and also how you are feeling? And that brings me to my fourth point, which is about how to communicate. As leaders, our job is not to only set the direction of where we wanna go, but to make sure that everyone is heading in the same direction, that we're all aligning and heading towards that objective. And the only way to do that is to communicate over and over and over again. You've probably heard that in a time of crisis, you can't communicate enough. And the purpose again of that communication is to pull back those connections, to reconnect people so we have those relationships because that's how we again create that stability and security so we can move together as an organization. So when I talk about communicating in 3D, I'm really talking about three dimensions of communications to think about how you would do things differently. First of all, over-communicate, as I mentioned before. We in the past, again, have always been thinking about communication as a scarcity. And that was very true in days where uh, it was hard to communicate with everybody. So you had to make sure that every message was perfect and on point. We can't live in that mentality anymore. Information and sharing communication is not a scarcity, it's an imperative. So you need to move from a scarcity mindset to a sharing mindset. How much more can you be open? Again, that mindset of being open is going to allow you to be able to, to share a lot more. Um, be multimodal. And what I mean by that is use every single channel that you can use. It could be email, it could be video, it could be one-on-one. -on -one. If you're handwriting notes even, that's really legitimate today. So with every channel you can use, use it to communicate. But make sure you have one place that is the truth, that people can turn to if they've missed a the communication. They go, did I hear that correctly? What's that source of truth? It could be on your intranet. It could be a document, one long, huge Google document. Whatever it is, this is the place where people can turn to reliably and know what the truth is. And then finally, think about remote first. And what I mean by that is even if things go back to some semblance of normal and people are coming back into the office, always remember that there, there is somebody who is not in the office with you. Instead of thinking as people in, in, in the comp inside, in person in your office or remote, think about it as one distributed team. And if you can treat every single person in that distributed team um, equally and have the same opportunities for contribution and communication, that makes a huge difference. The biggest danger we have is that we treat the person who is closest to us as our closest confidants versus the people who are remote to us as secondary citizens. I was speaking with one leader and he was saying that he has three remote people and three people who were in his office. And he made an extreme effort to make sure that he treated them the same, gave them the same responsibilities. And that if he communicated with somebody in person, that they would then make sure that showed up in their collaboration platform so that everything was captured, so that everyone had the same information. I think in particular, when you're thinking about communication, I love this quote from Risto Silasma. He's the chairman of Nokia. And if you think about um, what his company had to go through with the selling of the handsets to Microsoft, a rewording of the entire company, it's what every single one of us is dealing with in our organizations. And he said this, no news is bad news. Bad news is good news. And good news is no news. The idea here is if there's bad news, get it out there. Because when people know what's going on, they have that as, as, as a stable point. They're not wondering what is going on. They know what's going on now. And now we can move forward and deal with it. Bad news is actually good news because it allows us to deal with reality and then to start taking actions. So the worst thing you can do is to have no news. Um, what I like to do is also just make sure that you're thinking about how to create a new culture. There's no doubt that our cultures as we know them are not the same. So because we can't talk to each other, think about how you can engineer serendipity uh, to replace the, the water cooler or going out to lunch. 
Um, make sure you're sparking that non-work engagement by asking people like, so what did you do last night? Uh, sharing the pictures of your workspace. Tell us the most interesting kind of bizarre thing that we're all dealing with. Because uh, when we can step into the circle and share with each other what is going on in our lives, we form again those connections that form these deeper relationships. Finally, make sure you're creating new rituals. Our cultures are made up of rituals that mark the passing of time. Um, how are you going to welcome people? How will you recognize people? How will you say goodbye to people? All really important in establishing this new form of relationships that we have. And as a leader, it's incumbent on you to be able to create those new types of cultures rather than leave them to chance. All right, let's finish up the last area and then we can open up for Q&A. The last area is thinking about opportunity. And it may be like the last thing on your mind right now, but I think this is the perfect time to focus on the change and the impact that you can have. Um, I just want to talk about few, focusing on the future state because it seems like how on earth can we do that when things are changing every single day? Here's the reality. It's leaders create change. And if you're not creating change and you're not a leader, you're a manager. So what kind of change will you see inside your organization with your customers? How can you serve them in a better and different way? And this is the time when you really have to think about how your organization is going to have an impact, not only on the people's lives, but also in our communities when we all need to pull together. And this is where I think being a realist optimist is so important. We're gonna be optimistic about what the future could hold, but we also need to be realistic about what we need to do today to make that future come to pass. What I would encourage you also to think about is this data. I've been watching the, the tech and the business space for two decades now. And what we can see have over and over again is that great innovation comes out of, of, of recessions and depressions. You can see some of these great companies that were formed at the depths in these troughs. And so a couple reasons here is that new needs are emerging. And we also have an influx of talent, whereas we've been fighting for talent. Now we have so much talent and people who want to be employed. So if we can find those opportunities to serve customers in new and different ways, this is where innovation and ingenuity, where we have limited resources to create innovation are going to become very important. Three ways to figure out who your future customers are. This is the, the core of the, the disruption mindset is to focus so much on your future customers. Use empathy maps to understand who your customers are. What are your future customers saying, thinking, feeling, and doing? Because they're very different. And it's, it's constantly changing. So really go out there and really understand what are the needs of these future customers. Uh, create a customer advisory board. Pull them in closer to you and fill them with these future customers. Not your current customers, but your future ones. And very importantly, tap your customer obsessed employees, the people who are, are most adamant about working with with customers. You know who they are. They're always pushing the organization to go do better and faster. And so I think the last thing, and here's an empathy map I wanted to show you. Um, the last area is in particular um, the, the thing I wanted to say, say in that as leaders, we are being called upon to move out of our comfort zone right now. Um, it's, it's always the key of being at that edge. And, but it, this is where the magic happens. And we need a lot of magic right now. Uh, we need leaders to feel confident and have courage to move into this space. And I would say that you know you're doing it right when your palms are sweaty and your stomach is churning, and I'm sure all of us are, but this is when we need to have that courage. Because in the end, courage isn't just like moving blindly into the space. Courage is when you are moving into a place where you don't know the outcome, and yet you still move forward because you know you must. You must be that leader who can create that impact and change. So we can open up, open up for questions. Phew. Um, you, can, you can connect with me. I encourage you to. I would love to hear from you. How are things working? How are things not working? And I really do mean that. I, I put my information up on, on, on all of my end, end of presentations and nobody writes to me. So this is the time for us to connect. I encourage you also to come to quantum-networks.com. It's a community of disruptive leaders that I've created. It's free, it's a way for us to connect with each other. And I think we need more of each other to, to support and find this way forward. Okay, phew, so we have any questions? There we go, can you hear me all right? 
Oh, shoot. I can't hear you. The audio has gone out again. So how about this? I can see the chat. So how about if you put the questions into chat? Would that work? Because I don't want to refresh. Okay. Whoever can type fast. All right. Let's see. We can we can be flexible on this. All right. Um, I am seeing ask a question and I can see that. All right. All right. Here we go. All right. So um, my question is, what does the future business look like as remote work fits within it? I know it's a big question. Um, OK, so let me answer that one first. Um, the future of business, I think I, instead of thinking about it as remote work, think about it as distributed teams, because if we change our mindset around this, we're going to think about everybody in equal ways, because even when somebody's in your office, if they're on a different floor, they're going to feel like they're remote because you can't see them sitting next to you. So I think this is a mindset shift that we have to think about this all coming together as a permanent way of working. Even if somebody is in your office, but they're traveling, they're distributed. So you never know what people are going to be. So we need to get remove this whole word of remote from us because I think it says remote is not as good as in person. Um, I, I, I can always see when a company has this mindset because they ask me, so when is the next time you're going to be in New York? I go, why is that a barrier to us connecting and getting work done? Why is location ever going to be an issue again? So this is a new way of working and thinking in that even if somebody's sitting next to you, you have to work as a distributed team. All right, another question. I support leadership teams and managing uncertainty that comes with digital transformation. How do I find it to like, how hard is it to let go? All right, so leaders, leaders constantly think that this is horrible. I'm no longer in control. I have to ask, when were you ever in control? Because, I mean, that's the reality, right? And so if you were thinking that you were in control, you're living in a fallacy. You were never in control. You just had the semblance of control. A better way to think about this is not to be in control, but being in command. Command says when we're going to go in this direction, you're totally confident that people are going to follow you. Leadership is a relationship between the people who aspire to create that change to go in that, that direction and the people over here who are inspired to follow you. So it's just a relationship. That's why communication is a connection, why openness is so important because the way that the ways that you're going to create that credibility to be a leader is if you have that trust, that leadership ability. And so when it comes to uncertainty, it's so important to create more certainty more security. And it and actually, it seems counterintuitive. The more you are honest about the fact that you don't have the answers, but you have lots of good questions, actually makes people feel better. Because they're like, okay, you're being honest with me. You're telling me the truth. It's going to be hard. But that's what people need to hear right now. Um, let's see. Charlene, one, one second. Okay. I think question. everybody... Wait, I can't hear anything. One I more forget. question. I have to mouth. No, 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 no. I have to mouth everything. To and Charlene. then and I have to stop. Everybody, if you've got a question, <laughs> put it in the Q and A, and then Charlene will answer from the Q and A. Okay. So one more question. All right. Um, let's see. One more question. How can we restore the feeling of us living as a human in the age of shutdown? Okay. So I think one of the the biggest questions is. Um, Again, I'm, I'm in San Francisco. We have shelter in place. This is going to go on for a really long time. Um, one of the things that we have to get used to is that we can actually have relationships. We can have friendships and connections, even when we can't physically see people. The fact that we're on Zoom and, and on Crowdcast and all these other tools and technologies, we are so lucky to be able to do this. And in the same way that we felt like just calling somebody wasn't the same, um, emailing somebody isn't the same. It's not as good as in person, but my goodness, it's so much better than having no connection. And so I, I think more than anything else, I don't think that technology gets in the way of us being humans connecting with each other. Um, I think it's one of the things that we have empathy more than anything else. Um, he said, um, more than anything else, it's to get, make sure that we are connecting with each other at that human level to have not just compassion, but empathy um, for the questions that pe for people have um, for each other. Um, 
But one of the um, things that I have found most interesting is how an older generation has completely glommed onto this idea of using Facebook, for example. At first, people were saying, there's no way that we can use Facebook to really truly connect with each other. And we know for a fact that that is absolutely not true. The relationships that across all generations that people can have now through digital is absolutely real, absolutely tangible. And we as leaders need to be able to move into that same space. Um, we know how to do this personally. Now we need to know how to do this professionally too. Um, okay, I can keep asking question, answering questions. It looks like there are some questions in the chat, so I'll, go, I'll move over to there too as well. Um, I'm running a school. It's a huge challenge to have teachers do e-learning from students at home for a long period of time. Any thoughts on this? My goodness, teachers had a have a hard job as it is, and to add on top of that, all of this new e-learning um, as 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 um, a possible thing to do. I am not an expert on e-learning. Uh, but I do believe that this is going to be a partnership even more so now between teachers and the parents. And um, and, and as things start opening up, um, where there'll be smaller communities, for example, of learning in circles. Uh, so, and again, thinking about if there are kids, multiple kids in the household, how are you going to have those kids help each other too as well? We're talking about completely changing the way that e-learning is done. I, I, in my book, I, I um, highlighted one institution, Southern New Hampshire University, a, a private nonprofit school in Southern New Hampshire, 3,000 students on campus. They are running the largest e-learning um, organization in the world with over 180,000 students getting accredited degrees. And so this is absolutely doable. There are examples from people, and I think what we're seeing very quickly are new practices coming together. And so I know it's really hard right now, but again, as leaders in the classroom, there are more and more resources that people are putting up, lessons plans that parents and teachers can create together. So I really encourage you to go about and doing that. Um, Another question, the future of the gig economy, given individual contractors have a lot less demand in this time. If you think about gig economy as only Uber and Lyft, that's absolutely true. But if you think about gig economy as people being able to work and create um, new opportunities, that's completely different. I think the reality is we're going to have a huge amount of people who are have lost their jobs. They're going to be looking for new opportunities. There are so many opportunities right now. If you want to be able to go help with the shut-ins, to be able to go out there, um, do delivery, do services, check on people. Um, there are There is such a need for a particular type of work during this times of crisis. It's going to take us a little while to figure out where those opportunities are. But I think the fact that we have a robust gig economy with a very flexible workforce is going to actually help us. But it will take a couple of weeks for people to organize. And we as business leaders, the more that we can figure out how are we going to contribute. I know I can't make masks, but what are the things that I can do in terms of using my knowledge working skills to create the information and get it to the right places and facilitate that? How can I use my skills to connect customers with needs with people who can actually provide them? All right, let's see. I'm trying, I'm just funny running through here and see if there are other questions. Um, support leadership teams and managing uncertainty. Um, okay, that we did the control thing. Oh, how are leadership styles different in China versus the US? Um, again, we can talk about how to stop coronavirus. You can't stop it, we can just slow it down. Uh, but I, I've been studying and I've been doing research also of how leadership skills are different, how leadership cultures are different in different countries. And in fact, in this last um, study that I did, I did of a thousand leaders um, in the US, UK, Germany, Brazil, and in China. And what was interesting is, and I asked them about how do they think about disruption and how, dis how capable are they of driving disruption? U.S. was actually at the bottom of all of those five countries. Um, our ability to be flexible and confident about our ability to drive disruptive change is okay on a scale of one to 10, about five, six or so. Brazil was off the charts. They were close to eight. China was right behind them at 7.7. .7. Uh, Germany was in the middle around six. UK was just a little bit higher. What was interesting is, again, the, the, the cultures that we have in China and Brazil, much more oriented um, towards entrepreneurship, getting around the rules, and just constantly, again, looking for opportunities for change. 
it's been the driver of the, the Chinese economy. And so I think in many ways, um, the, the fact that China has, again, a state controlled government, they were able to shut things down. Here in the US, we want our democracies, we want our freedoms, we want to be able to walk outside if we want to. And so I, I am really um, kind of pessimistic about our ability to weather this as well as China has. Um, our ability to really make the sacrifices individually for the greater good. I think that 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 reality is going to sink in, but it's going to take a couple of weeks. I mean, know that the numbers are that for every day you delay um, social distancing, the cases go up by 40 percent. So the, the best thing I can think of is as leaders is to demonstrate and encourage everyone as much as possible in your workplace now to do what's necessary. It is incredibly painful. Um, our, our revenues and our businesses, our livelihoods are at stake. But I think even more importantly, our um, way of life, our, our loved ones are in danger and at stake. So we as leaders, again, those stakeholders that I was talking about, um, of employees, em um, customers, the community, suppliers, and also our shareholders need to be in balance. Right now, the shareholders, I think, are understanding and, 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 and realize that we have other things we have to think about, in particular, our community. Um, so I, again, to the extent that we can put the resources that we have, our assets, and it's the hardest thing in the world. I'm looking at our livelihood. We're looking at the, the continuation of our businesses. What can we do? What cat sacrifices can we do? Because uh, we are at a state of war. Uh, that's, that's really what we're at. That's the kind of urgency I think we're in today. And we need more leaders to be able to step up and to create that change. All right. Um, we still have time, I think, to ask more questions. OK, good. Um, I'm going to keep going here. I've got five more minutes. Oh, OK, mental health consequences, um, isolation and burnout um, due to lack of daily interactions, um, health sector. OK, um, one of the most um, I've been hearing it. it there are there are people I, I keep thinking the name of it. It's on, been advertised on NPR, uh, but the ability to deliver mental health services to people remotely. If we can do telemedicine remotely, we can deliver uh, mental health services remotely. We also know that one of the most powerful things to help create mental health are groups, people we can gather in groups um, of small groups and talk about things. It's the foundation for Alcoholics Anonymous. It is the foundation for these peer-based advisory groups. When people can get together and talk about these things, not just one-on-one, -on -one, it's incredibly powerful. And so I, I encourage you as leaders to form these groups inside your organizations, inside your communities, make sure people are connecting. The worst thing you can do is to say to people, you know, just go in and shrink down into yourself because that's where fear and paranoia and depression take over. It's when you're reaching out and connecting with people. And so I think what it's been encouraging to see how much people are reaching out to each other. Um, I have friends who I haven't talked to and spoken to, which is kind of message each other. who are actually setting aside time to do Zoom calls and gather together and support each other. Um, I, I think more than anything else now, that mental health, the connections that we have are so important. And we as leaders need to step up and make sure that people are connecting in that way. Um, what do you, uh, what crowdsource, let's say, uh, la, la, la. So yeah, there's lots of people putting up resources in here. Um, let's see, um, someone pointed out that um, that China as, as China's government is contradiction in terms of speaking about openness and accountability. Let me just address that for one thing. It's it's, it's interesting that um, it, it again having spoke and, and, and worked with quite a few um, Chinese governments and and also uh, organizations. I want to differentiate what the government is doing on a social point of view and also what they're doing a, a social and political point of view and also what they're doing an economic point of view. They have a tacit com, um, com, uh, compromise that if we give you economic freedom, you're going to compromise on your political freedom. And for the most part, people are pretty comfortable with that. But we're seeing now most recently that that is not acceptable anymore. Uh, and so what we're, we're seeing challenges now to how much China is going to open up on the political side of things. And what's interesting is things were going, it was going to be fine as long as the economic and health and security were going to be all provided for by the government. But when it's not, they're going to be challenged. 
And what my work has been around leadership, and also I did quite a bit of academic work around dictators, in that dictators and authoritarian governments, communist governments, have a problem called the monarch's dilemma. The monarch's dilemma is how do you let go of control without things getting out of control? Because if you open the door just a little bit, that may be a crack that, um, that eliminates your entire authority to rule. So that's what China is grappling with right now. And I think in some ways, that's the biggest fear that we as organizations, as leaders also suffer from. How do I give up a little bit of control and feel comfortable that the whole thing isn't going to go to pot? And what I think China, we're going to see um, in China is a greater sense of that ability uh, so they don't have as fragile a situation and realize that openness is going to be beneficial to them. So it'd be interesting to see how that happens. All right. Um, let's see. I'm just checking through here to see if there are other questions we have. Um, so the dilemma that I just called was called the Marnike's um, Marnik dilemma. And... Uh, and, and that's a very specific thing uh, that Samuel P. Huntington, a professor at Harvard, uh, wrote about. I feel like I'm going back to my, my college dissertation and, and thesis around this, so this is fun to go back into that. Um, any advice for onboarding new employees where everyone is working remotely? That's a great question. So you think about the onboarding rituals that we have. It typically was on, uh, um, on the job training. And frankly, that's not a good situation to be in because everybody's onboarded differently. When you are in a virtual situation, there's a practice um, of writing everything down, of working out loud is another way. There's a great book about working out loud. And I think that's a really good practice because now when somebody comes on board, you're going to read through the entire list of things you need to know. So instead of somebody like haphazardly taking you through this and somebody else would focus on different things, everybody focuses on the same thing because it's all written down. That discipline of having your processes, your structure, everything written down means that everyone is on the same page. I can't begin to stress how important it is to capture that. And again, it's going to be a good thing for you as an organization going forward. I am a big believer in structure and process and governance. And the reason why people don't do this is like, well, then I don't have freedom to be creative. That's not true, because when you know exactly how things are supposed to work, then you can you don't have to worry about it. And you can use that as a springboard to bounce off of and do all the creative and hard things because you can focus 100 percent of your efforts, of your creativity on the work to be done, not how it's going to be done. I can't begin to tell you how important it is to take the time right now to lay down that structure, to make sure that Everybody is on the same page. So I think more than anything else, this is a great opportunity. Don't think of it as a burden. Think about it as an opportunity to create that structure. Um, I, I look at the best, most disruptive companies. I fill them with my book. And, and the thing that I found over and over again, they are incredibly disciplined, incredibly well-run companies. They Everything is completely organized. And that's what allows them to be disruptive, to take on these amazing, audacious things, because they know it's going to work. They're confident that they're going to figure it out. Even if they have to fail 200 times, they will get there. All right. Um, I, again, I, my, my slides are going to be available. Happy to send um, those to you. Again, I encourage you to engage with me. Um, I need as much information from you as you need it from me because I want to continue doing this research. I would love to hear what's working, but it's not one of the questions. I may not have all the answers, but I think we're gonna get there together. Um, I just wish you all the luck. This is an incredibly tough time and we need more leaders like you to step up to the plate. So do whatever you can do to be as strong, to show up, to take care of yourself, to find that time and space, to make sure that you can show up and be the best leader you can be for everybody in your community. All right, I think I am done. Thank you so much. I'll give you guys a virtual elbow bump and good luck to all of you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right, thank you, Charlene, even though she cannot hear me, but she knows that we are grateful for uh, such a great session today. So love all the uh, engagement in the chat over there. Clearly this is a session that mattered and good news, we've got more of it coming. Um, I didn't 
I unfortunately didn't get to have a dialogue with uh, Charlene like we normally would, but she did a fantastic job of, of pulling in those questions. Uh, I wanted to touch on just a couple things that jumped out at me as somebody who's uh, been working in a distributed team for the last uh, about two years now. And I couldn't agree more with her comment about you need to remove the word remote. There's this idea when you've got there's remote and there's in person, it immediately creates this divide and you don't know you don't really think about it because you oh yeah these people are remote today but it, it does unnecessary things um, and creates those unnecessary challenges when you're really trying to bring people together the next thing that i that um, is a big takeaway for me and and i can definitely vouch for is the importance of documentation process and structure and yes like charlene said it feels like oh my gosh process structure like it's going to slow me down I tell you what, when you do it right um, and you take the time to do it, you get to spend so much more time on the the fun stuff, uh, the creative stuff, which is where I think all of us would, would prefer to be stri uh, thriving in anyways. And the last thing that I want to mention is that fear plays such a big role um, in making some of these changes because it's so hard for us to leave behind what we, what we know, right? What's comfortable. Um, we have to have the courage to go and try something new. And so what I encourage all of you to do is depending where you're at with your distributed or virtual uh, work at this point in time, you've obviously had to take the first step and you're having to figure it out. But each day, take that next step and try something new. Charlene's got a lot of good stuff in here. Um, hopefully you all went and downloaded her slides. I know that we'll be hosting a lot more content on this in the near future. So um, we will keep you all posted. With that, I'm gonna go grab uh, Gary A. Bowles and we will be back to continue talking about uh, distributed teams, remote work and all that kind of fun stuff. See you soon.